So help me know a little bit about who you are and uh, students, what kind of programs you're all in. Are you in STEM programs, nearly everybody in the room? Uh, raise your hand if you are. Uh, and if you're not, do we have others who might just be here as a friend? <laughs> oh, the, the two ladies helping us organize the whole thing are not a part of STEM programs at all? <laughs> well, thank you. I didn't realize that. You've done a great job helping make this happen. I, I read through the website with regard to the past Chris lectures, and Dr. Uh, Wickman was the one that contacted us at EMI last year to invite us to come and participate in this lecture series. And af after reading some of the list of presenters and lectures and topics, I honestly have to confess to you that I was intimidated. So I hope I don't disappoint tonight with what we'll be sharing. I hope that you see an incredible opportunity before you to use just who you are, who God has made you as men and women to minister to the world through the natural gifts and talents and abilities that God's put in your life, that, that you would see every bit, the calling that God's put in your life as future professionals within the STEM branches of study and work, that it's, it's a bona fide, necessary, and valuable piece of the body of Christ for the sake of reaching the world. And I don't know if anybody's ever been telling you that, but I'm here tonight to encourage you in that, that end. So with that, with that, let's start. That, that last tagline of the good, the bad, and the ugly really is just a joke. But I'm serious about our privilege and our problem when I speak of, of applied design and adapting it to the developing world. So let me just jump in to uh, the, the briefest of discussions about who EMI is because that's less important than talking about the subject matter tonight of actually using design as an expressed field of study in science and combining it as we understand this lecture series of culture and faith and science and how do they all converge? Why is it so important that we talk about this and why does it matter at all for the kingdom of God? So I, I want you to understand who EMI is, but it's less important. This is not a pitch for EMI tonight, but you understand that my, all of my experience comes through our organization. I have a, a, just a few copies of this printed publication that we put out once a year called Inside EMI. And it's got some of our best stories with partners all around the globe with what's happening through engineering and architecture used in missions with our partners on the ground serving the poor. Great stories. I don't have nearly enough copies for everyone, but all you would need to do is go to inside.emiworld.org and you can read it on your desktop page by page. Just turn the pages. So it's there for you to access electronically. Uh, but I'll leave a few of these with the folks who are hosting us tonight. So designing a world of hope is our tagline, and I would hope that you understand that that really is what we're about, is offering hope to a broken world that's so desperate for it. In a nutshell, EMI's mission and vision uh, can be summed up in just a few one-liners, that we're designing a world of hope for the physically and spiritually poor. We recognize that those two things interface regularly, and our vision is pretty simple when it comes to the infrastructure that we're trying to design for missionary efforts all around the globe. Just think of any missionary that you have contact with, and God calls men and women to reach the poor and the lost, and they're planted in the middle of nowhere all around the globe, but what do they know about adapting design to the needs of the poor? What do they know about developing hospitals and giant orphanage campuses and schools and clinics and outreach centers, training facilities? They usually know very little about the world of design that engineers and architects and land surveyors, construction managers all need to share with them. So that's where EMI comes in. And the core approach has always been, since we were founded in the early 80s, to mobilize short-term mission trips of design professionals, usually Westerners, all over the world. That's changing, and I'll share a little bit about that in the middle of the presentation. So you'll see where, just where we're going with the future. Now, all of that to say that I just gave you a whole lot of what is EMI all about, and I'd like to back up and just review a little bit about what we're going to talk about tonight. We're going to talk a little bit about you, and we're going to talk a little bit about God, and we're going to talk a little bit about the world. And then we're going to see how all of those things come together because of the whole world of STEM. 
when we think about the sciences and, and uh, the applied, applied design from engineering and math and physics and those things. And we've certainly had math and physics majors who are our interns at EMI, not just the engineers and architects. But how many of you love TED Talks? I understand that Dr. Wickman was actually working on her own TED Talk last year uh, before she had left the department. But one of the most watched TED Talks is Simon Sinek's Start With Why. Anybody ever hear it or see it? I recommend you go find it. It's only about 17 minutes long. But Simon helps us understand that we, we need to understand what makes the best inspiring leaders and communicators. And I just gave you five minutes of what. And when we focus on the what, we tend to lose people. But Simon asks the question, how do you explain when others achieve things that seem to defy all the odds and all our assumptions? And it's all about what, how, and why in the order that we embrace that in the world as we communicate. So the best, the best communicators all work in the exact same way, and it's usually the opposite of what everybody else does. Most of us tend to start with what? What we know, what we do. Think about yourself at any kind of social gathering, a party, a family get-together, and it's always about what we do or what we're doing right now. And then we move to how we do it, and sometimes we never even get to the why. And Simon, in his TED Talk, tries to encourage us that we already know that. Everybody knows what they do. Some know how, very few actually get to the core of the why. And he's asking these basic questions in his talk. What's your purpose, your cause, or your belief? Why do you exist? Why do you get out of the bed in the morning? And why does anybody care? And so why needs to be central to that question, right at the core. We say what we do and how we're better or different, and then we expect some sort of behavior to follow. Now, Simon is doing this TED Talk as a business sort of teaching. I'm convinced we need to apply it in the spiritual realm of how we live and work in the world. It's uninspiring if we stick to just the what and the hows. If you don't know why you do what you do, and that's what people respond to, then how are we ever going to get people to follow along? And that has to do with evangelism, that has to do with mobilization, it has to do with missions efforts, it has to do with the church fulfilling its core role in the world. And Simon likes to put it this way, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And again, this is kind of a core business principle, but I would adapt that to the old adage that says people won't care how much you know until they know how much you care, right? It's a very similar concept. We need to be all about the why we're doing anything that we're doing. And it will just serve as the proof of all the what and the how or the what and the how serves as the proof, excuse me, the other way around, of our whys. We can spend all that time. We need to. We need to get into the what's and the how's, but only as the proof of that deep core thing that's driving us all as, as who we are as men and women in the body of Christ. And that's why I'm pretty passionate about this. I teach this at EMI. I teach this with other ministry organizations. I teach this with some professionals. How many of you ever read Rick Warren's Purpose Driven Life? For those of you who are 20-somethings today, that's already an old text of at least 15 years ago. But it's, a, it's worth going and looking for. And Rick Warren, in that book, uses some catchy titles for the sake of the body of Christ to remember we've been planned for God's pleasure and formed for his family and shaped for service and made for mission. And when he gets to that idea of you've been shaped for service, he uses that acronym, SHAPE. And that's your spiritual gifts, your heart, your abilities, your personality, and your experiences in life. And all those things combine to make you a very unique you. And I've thrown up a couple scripture references here. Hopefully you're familiar with them. Psalm 139 is extolling the omnipotence of God and his incredible sovereignty over us and the idea that he knows the details of our little lives. That every day was known to him before a day came to be for me. And every word is known before it's on my tongue. And every hair is numbered. And there's nowhere I can go away from God's presence. And it speaks of this incredible plan and sovereignty of God. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God has made you with a purpose and a destiny and a place to fit? in his plan to reach the world. And that's something we ought to review here. Because the biggest why should I care about any of this 
is because God's plan is to reach the world and he's busy doing it. And somehow he invites us to partner with him and cooperate with him. Anybody ever hear of the Perspectives Course in World Christian Movement? It's usually held in various cities all around the country. You could sign up and be a part of a 12-week course. And of course, that's a difficult thing to do when you're in the middle of your student years in, at university. But it's a great study course that helps you see that indeed God is calling us to partner with him in the work that he's already doing in the earth. And that's our incredible privilege. There's problems that come immediately as we begin to grapple with that. But Ephesians 2.10 is that great verse that follows the discourse on faith by salvation by grace and justification by faith. But immediately after that is this incredible verse tucked in there that says, for you are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God's prepared in advance for us to do. Do you, do you see the relationship? So we're not working to approve, to win approval with God. We're not working to earn his love. We're not working to earn salvation. But the moment we come into this relationship with God, we recognize that there's an enormous amount of work to be done that he's prepared in advance for us to do that we would fulfill his plan in the earth. And then 1 Peter 4.10 is that each of you should use whatever gift he's been given to serve. So we start to put all these pieces together recognizing that I have this very unique shape and it's full of the what and the how that leads me to the answer of why. And why do I exist? And why do I get out of the bed in the morning? And I want to tell you, if you're a math major, if you're a physics major, if you're an engineering major, if you're an architecture major, that's a reason to get out of bed in the morning and to ask God, how do I take who you've made me to be and serve the world with it? And that's where EMI comes in because it's an incredibly practical place. Now, I told you we were going to talk a little bit about you, a little bit about God, a little bit about the world. And so let's just see how all of those things come together. Leave it to engineers to use a Venn diagram to talk about spiritual things, right? So we, we see the God things and the things of the world and the things about you all converging in this place where everything comes together to be what I would call the sweet spot that you would find what God has made you to be. Do we need to review that just for one more second? For those of you who are trying to quickly sketch that, you'll have access to this later. But it's just a simple idea that says there's, there's so many places for us to serve in the world, so many different opportunities. There's big overarching ideas, the biblical narrative and the function of missions of the church in the world today. And then you, you, you one single person, the uniqueness of you, somehow partnering with God in all these things. It's an incredible thing. Okay, so back to this. I would hope that you would all find that this is true in your life, that you'd get to that place and you'd find that convergence and you'd know this is who I was created to be and what I was created to do. And I don't know if you've heard this quote, but Howard Thurman was a, a early 20th century pastor, minister, and he's credited with this quote that John Eldridge used in Wild at Heart, which many people misquote. But he's the one who said, go and do what makes you come alive. Because that is indeed what the world needs, is people who have come alive. And I would just add how much more those of us who have been made alive in Christ to take all the gifts and talents and skills that God's given us. So we haven't even yet gotten into applied design and engineering and all that thought. But this is fundamental to where we're going, the why. We've got to understand why it's so important that God's making us the way we are this unique population of designers, of scientists, of researchers, of inventors, the people who are problem solvers and perfectionists and often very driven planners. And we were jokingly talking about that around the dinner table this evening with a small group that I've never been so challenged to give up my own plans and my own insistence on having things right as when I have gone into the developing world and have to figure out how to apply all that I know. And we'll get to that idea too. So today in our culture, we have a classic struggle between two sides telling us what we ought to do, right? What is constantly bombarding us. One of the things that happened in my life that God has used as a training ground for me 
is that shortly after I agreed, okay, I'm going to turn my life upside down, I'm going to leave my job at the University of Buffalo, I'm going to end my consulting business, I'm going to uproot my family, join a, a faith-supported missions work of a tiny little group of about six people back in Colorado Springs. That's all we were in the 90s. The six people. Today, and you'll get a little bit more of this in the presentation, today we're close to 120 full-time staff and interns all around the globe in multiple offices in many different countries. And I've watched that growth happen over the last 18, 19 years that I've been a part of this organization. But when that happened, when I made that decision, and my wife and I knew all, well, we thought we knew all that that was going to take, two weeks later I fell from a ladder and I shattered my leg. And I live with the effects of that for the rest of my life. I can no longer run. I used to be a runner, used to be more of an athlete than I was as I've aged now. But God has used that as my training ground in faith to learn weakness and disability and humble me and learn greater levels of faith. I only say that because of this. We're constantly being told what to do because every morning I get my workout on a treadmill at the Y with the news coming at me from the left and the right, literally on my left and right. So I got Fox News here and CNN here, and I'm getting the left and right's perspective on what I ought to do. And that's what the world is all about all around us, telling us what they think and what we should do. And they rarely get to the heart issues of the why that really answers people's questions. So when we think about how do we get back to the why, I've always got to bring us back to Jesus. So we're going to do a little Bible study now because as you heard from my bio, I'm not just an architect with EMI, I'm a minister and I'm a pastor, preacher, teacher, evangelist sort of guy and I'm one of the few people at EMI that are wired this way. And I can't talk much about God's purpose for you as a designer, as a scientist, as a researcher, whatever you're going to find your place doing, I can't talk much about that without constantly coming back to the biblical story of God's purposes in our lives. So let me just preach with you for just a few minutes and we'll continue on, all right? So we, we look at what Jesus did and I believe he was a master of getting at the why. Think about how he called the disciples. You'd remember the story. We won't be opening our Bibles and reading. But he comes to the banks of the Galilee and he calls fishermen. And the first thing he says is, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and they followed him. Now there may be more to the story than that. I know for me there surely would have had to been an interview and a job description and a, dis and a discussion about benefits and certainly what about my family and how about the tenure and what about the future? I would have needed a whole lot more details and I, I see that I keep walking in front of my slides but you guys are way over there on this room. Uh, Jesus cuts through all of the what and the how and he doesn't focus on that at all. Instead he takes the metaphor of who they are fisherman and says, I'm going to show you what that means for the why of your life to reach the world. So something they understand, the whole idea of the physical world in the realm that they live in, the daily life of fishermen, Jesus takes them immediately to a calling for the rest of their lives in the deepest places of their heart's cry, why do I exist and why am I this person and why do I get out of bed in the morning? And he's a master at it. He does it over and over again. If you read that whole chapter of the woman at the well, when you realize Jesus did not have to go through Samaria, but he chose to, when a Jew would normally avoid Samaria, he chose to because he wanted to meet that woman at the well. And he cuts right through all of the distracting what's that she wants to build a smoke screen about and avoid getting at the heart of the details of her life. And Jesus cuts right to the quick and ministers to her in such a way that her life is transformed in a moment. And the end of that chapter says, many believed in that village because of the testimony of the Samaritan woman. Why? Because Jesus wasn't at all concerned with the smoke screen of the what's and the how's. He reached deeply into the how's. I love, I'm going to go right to the rest for the weary scripture for the sake of time. Think about Jesus speaking to the masses. And he says, come to me, all you who are heavy laden and burdened, and I will give you rest. If there's anything I've learned in working in the developing world context for almost 20 years, among multiple faiths and multiple cultures and beautiful people all over the world, is that every, 
Every culture in the earth understands there's a certain degree of brokenness in the human spirit, in the human condition, human nature, as C.S. Lewis would speak about it in Mere Christianity. If you haven't read that, add that to your reading list. And every world religion and philosophy has a solution to that brokenness, and it's all burdensome. It's a long list of what we must do and how we must do it. Do you see that? What and how? Everyone understands there's something about us that's broken. And that there's a real validity in that. There's a, there's, it's worth examining the five pillars of Islam or the four noble truths in the eightfold path of Buddhism or even some of the practices of Hinduism. It's worth understanding some of that only so that you would understand the need for people to, to, to reconcile their brokenness. But it's all burdensome. It's all, it's all a heavy laden burden on people and it doesn't lead to peace or rest. And even sacramental theology within Christianity is laden with that kind of burdensome list of rules of do's and don'ts. And even the Jews of the day that Jesus was speaking to understood that. They, they were loaded with this heavy burden of obligation. And he's cutting right through all that, saying it's not about the what and the how, it's about who and why. Come to me, and I will give you rest. It's the most amazing discourse on why versus what. And so if we were to take this one step further to give, bring it back to us, I'd have to say, why did Jesus die? And so I'm sure in this bright group here tonight, we'd have a multiple number of good evangelical answers. And I won't go there. I won't ask for hands raised and give me an answer. But I'm sure we'd get some good evangelical pieces of the story. But let's just point to one particular verse that is a great big why. He died for all so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. 2 Corinthians 5.15. That's a pretty plain answer. Why did Jesus die? It answers it. He died so that we, wouldn't know, we would no longer live for ourselves. What does that mean for those of us who are coming out of the design professions or the studies of STEM and where we find ourselves in our places in the world? Well, this is part of the privilege and the problem, as I subtitled the talk tonight. But we find our mission there in that chapter in 2 Corinthians 5. Therefore, we have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. And the rest of that entire chapter, I won't read it all for you. But God's reconciled us to himself, and he's given us a ministry of reconciliation in the world as his ambassadors. That you would, like Job 9.33 is one of my favorite verses, where Job in his misery and pain is crying out, not understanding what God is doing in his life. He knows this great and unsearchable and loyal, faithful God, but he can't feel him, he can't touch him, he can't understand him at the moment. And he says, if only there were someone who would arbitrate between us and lay his hands on us both. And that's the ministry of reconciliation that we are called to as the church in the earth today. That we would have one hand in the riches of heaven hanging on tight to God and another hand available to touch the hurting and broken and lost of the world. And we do that with whatever gifts, whatever talents, whatever shape is unique to us that God's given us, we do that. And so let's just take that to the next place. The challenge that we've been given is replete throughout Scripture, verse after verse after verse after verse. God cares for the lost, the poor, the downtrodden, those who are impoverished, those who have been treated harshly, those who live with injustice. On and on and on and on. God reveals his heart. And this is where I found myself so many years ago, saying, I don't understand this heart. I don't have this heart. What's missing in me? I, I happened to visit Asbury Seminary in Kentucky where a British woman named Jackie Pollinger was speaking about 20 years ago. And she, as a young 20-something, gave her heart to Christ and felt like God would have her go into the mission field. And she got on a boat and never came home and has ministered to opium addicts and prostitutes and gang members in the walled city in Hong Kong her whole life. In 89, I believe, the walled city was finally torn down. But the, the, the vestiges of the gangs and the slums is still there and she, her work continued. 
And for many, many years, her work looked like death in her own words. It was such a discouraging and hard place to minister and serve. But then she said, if you must stay here, and she's speaking to a group of seminarians. I happen to be a visiting architect from Western New York who hears this message. She said, if you, if you must stay here, stay only if you're called and become famous in your outreach to the poor and the widow, the orphan, the alien, and the stranger. And I had never heard something like that before. She's, she's recognizing that Jesus said, go into all the world, therefore, and make disciples. So there's room to answer the question, if you must stay, stay if you're called. And there's a model in the, the book of Acts for us, the early church, that says many are called to stay, while some are called to be sent. Not everyone is called to be sent. But she recognizes in the staying, we still ought to be consumed with God's heart for the poor from all of this scriptural record. And I knew I wasn't there. And so the greatest why question of my life came to, came to the forefront. 20 years ago, and the Holy Spirit kept nagging at me, Gary, why must you stay? Why must you stay? And my answers were, well, my retirement at the University of Buffalo, and my, I had the equivalent of tenure in the professional track. They called it permanent appointment. You can't lose those jobs short of a felony. And I, I had my professional track mapped out. I had a consulting business. I was a leader in my local church. I was raising my kids in a church school that we had created on the campus of the church. I was gutting and rebuilding houses along the way, and those were my little gems, and building, 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 building. And on and on, the long list of me and my stuff went. And I promise you, that awaits you after this education that you're seeking. The potential for the Western American dream version of Christianity. It can be yours. And I promise you, it's a nightmare in the end if we don't answer this question of why right now. Why am I here tonight? Why is God building into me all these skills as I study in the STEM fields, whatever yours happens to be? The why challenge continues before us with so much of the world living on less than a dollar a day. This is an older statistic from the UN Human Development Index from several years ago. But the vast majority of the global south has huge populations of people living on less than a dollar a day. There's a little bit more current uh, information from 2012 in the World Bank, but it's very similar statistics. And the World Bank defines poverty as $1.25 a day. And roughly a sixth of the world's population, or 1.4 billion people, lack the basic ability to fulfill human needs that are very, very basic. Food, clothing, shelter. And then we would add to things like that health care and education and the literacy rates and opportunity and all those things that come with injustice across the world. God cares about these people, and I didn't have any understanding of that. You're way ahead of the curve just being here tonight, where you are in life. So the challenge continues because this is what awaits you. And this happens to be the workstation of my own son, who's 30 years old and is a structural engineer in downtown Denver. And he participated in mission trips among the poor his, his, during most of his teenage years with me. And his heart and the heart of his wife is to participate again as a volunteer with EMI. But he's got obligations and responsibility, and life just keeps marching on. So he's got a home, and he's got two young children, and one, a third on the way, and he's a structural engineer. And he's, he's very much an American structural engineer. So he's grappling with how do I balance who I know God's made me to be and the desires in my heart and the need to serve my family and the need to pursue my career and use all my gifts. It's a challenge that will always be before us as Westerners. So make room for the question. Ask God why are you putting all of this into my life and where will it come out in the future? How will I embrace the challenge and not lose sight of that vision? And it rages in us as a conflict. So Stephen Colbert, how many of you know Stephen Colbert, who of course now has taken over The Late Show from David Letterman, but before when he did The Colbert Report, 
he would always use his caustic brand of humor to stab the right, and I would have to quietly and secretly laugh because he just, he just always made me laugh. And he just had an amazing way of touching on our issues that we have. If we're going to preach conservatism, what does that mean for caring for the world and caring for others? And he said this in response to a Bill O'Reilly comment. But if this is going to be a Christian nation that doesn't help the poor, either we've got to pretend that Jesus was just as selfish as we are, or we've got to acknowledge that he commanded us to love the poor and serve the needy without condition, and then admit that we just don't want to do it. How's that for a stab at the body of Christ across the world? Certainly the Western church, the American church. But this is what the world sees. The world sees a problem with the church. And I meet people all the time on planes. It's an easy place to open the door to share and learn people's stories because they'll just ask me one simple question as I'm traveling around the world. What are you doing? Why are you on this plane flying through Europe? Because I've just come from some Sahara in Africa. And I'll give them the one-liner and I'll keep it pretty light. And I'll say I work for a relief and development organization that mobilizes engineers and architects to volunteer their time serving the poor around the world, designing hospitals and schools or orphanages or, or whatever. And they will naturally almost always say, oh, that's a wonderful thing you're doing. And then we have an opportunity. Because I could either just deflect it. Sometimes I'm exhausted. Sometimes I'm just thinking I need to sleep. But if I engage them, I could talk to them for 10 more hours. And I have to at least recognize that it's a privilege to do this. God's called me into it. But I could easily draw them into understanding who Jesus is. Because I have to tell them, if they say that, what a wonderful thing you're doing, I have to say, you got to know that I don't do this because I'm such a wonderful guy. In fact, I lived for years totally unaware of the needs of the poor. And people, let me tell you, the poor of the world, if they could actually verbalize it, they would be shouting to you, send us your STEM professionals. <laughs> send us those people who are researchers and scientists and inventors mathematicians and physicists, but certainly engineers and architects who apply design in a practical way. They'd be asking for it if they knew how to verbalize it. And I have to let people know I don't do it because I'm so wonderful, but because of who Jesus is. And most of the world has not really seen Jesus. They've only seen a poor representation of him, a, a representation that looks selfish or self-consumed or arrogant or judgmental. And we all have to take that. We have to take that. It's what Colbert gave us as an indictment. We have to accept it and then ask God why. So out of the challenge and out of the conflict, we find calling. And this happens to be my typical office. When we think about how does EMI apply good design all over the world, we take what we know and we go. And this just happens to be a tiny little thatched hut in the middle of Thailand, slash and burn happening in the background, and we travel with all our electronics and run one zip line from a generator, and we plug in and we power up and we work away. We take what we know and we go. And that's, that's a simple little one-liner that you can remember. But in that, then, we have the rest of the talk tonight. The challenge, the incredible problems that come with what we take what we know and we go, incredible challenges await us. But we find our calling. And this is the greatest metaphor for engineers and architects, I believe. Right out of Isaiah 58, if you spend yourselves on behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, promises come along in this. And finally, we have this metaphor for ourselves that we will be called repairer of broken walls and restorer of streets with dwellings. It's such an incredible physical manifestation of this metaphor of us as designers of problem solvers, of creative thinkers, those who come to try to solve the needs of others and to serve them. So this naturally leads us to the how and the what. If we finally have grappled deeply with the why, which I believe we have now, as we've done this little Bible study, we've talked about you, how God has created you uniquely. And I'm really, really impressed at the number of women in the audience tonight because, of course, we're underrepresented in the design professions globally. And so it's very encouraging when we see a 50-50 split with women entering all of the professions of the sciences and design in the worlds of engineering and architecture, etc. But we need to ask what we're doing and how we're doing it. And this is a question that rages in the church. 
constantly. Different denominations have different philosophies and different answers. And we're always asking, should our focus be to help the poor or share the gospel? And in the world that we live in, we found the both end of that. It's been a heated debate, but E. Stanley Jones, a British missionary to India, has become a hero of mine. Most of my heroes are dead missionaries. And I read their biographies, and I learn of their stories, and I know what they've done to touch the world. And I know that that's what God's making my life into. But E. Stanley Jones used this, and it's a powerful word picture for us. The individual gospel, that would be the message of salvation. Without the social gospel, that would be the practical outworking of meeting people's needs and serving people is like a soul without a body. And the social gospel without the individual gospel is a body without a soul. One's a corpse and the other's a ghost. And equally, I would just add this. This is just Gary McPhee, not E. Stanley Jones. Equally, each are abhorrent or scary or detestable. So whether the church is looking like a ghost, vaporous, disappearing, insignificant, not making an impact, or whether the church doesn't look like the church at all, but just another relief and development service organization because they're doing good work, but they don't ever mention the name of Christ. One way or another, we're dead or we're vaporous. We're, somehow we're ineffective. But when we think about the Great Commission and the Great Commandment coming together, that's the both end of integral mission, where faith and works meet one another. And I'm told that a theme verse for the university this year is that we would love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love our neighbor as ourselves. Well, there's no other more practical place to make that happen than when you bring integral mission together and you recognize that I am doing both with an individual gospel and a social gospel, and I'm concerned about all these things just as God is. So the design professions, I am convinced, will play a critical role in the ongoing worldwide missions movement. And I shared this with our small group at dinner tonight. The hardest to reach places on earth that are left will more likely be met by, will be reached by professionals, not professional missionaries. I'm simply talking professionals like all of the STEM technical people of the world who have a reason and a purpose to go into all the world. My visa says I'm an architect going into all the world. I don't have to come up with a new job description of teaching English as a second language or doing some other service work. Who I am and what God has made me opens the doors of the world to me in a way that's natural and proves who I am and proves my love for people because I can serve them with the skills that God has given me. And so EMI's growth around the world has been a bit organic and it's been a bit strategic. Today it's very strategic as we think about how we've grown with the nine different offices that I've been referring to. Two, are, two currently are not up and running, but all the team are learning French in France or Spanish down in Central America, and they'll be ready and up and running by the end of the year for Senegal and Nicaragua. And our next office that's soon to come will be, well, I should just jump to this. This happens to be the first building that we've actually designed ourselves managed the construction ourselves, raised all the money ourselves, and this is EMI Uganda. And it will become the hub of EMI in, the f in future generations. It's the first and only building we own anywhere in the world, and we've established it in Uganda in the heart of the Eastern Hemisphere. Now this is where our strategic growth continues, and our next office by 2017 will be planted in the Southeast Asian Peninsula, likely Phnom Penh in Cambodia. We're in the process of investigating that right now. But if you draw that circle on your map, have you ever seen that statistic that helps you realize that? That more people live inside that radius than outside. It's outrageous. When we think of the 1.3 billion in India and the 1.2 billion, I mean in China, and 1.2 billion in India, and then the balance of all of Southeast Asia, Considering the landmass of Africa, you would be shocked to realize only 640 million people live in all of Africa. And out of that 640 million, one quarter of them are all Nigerians. Imagine the density in that armpit area of, of Africa. And yet the vast majority of the concentration of the people and the need and the unreached peoples of the world still exists in so much of that circle. And that's why EMI recognizes that's our strategic field of growth that has to come next. 
projects all across the world at EMI. I don't really need to talk about that very long, but I really want us to just jump into this and then we'll talk for the rest of the night about the challenges of applying design in an unfamiliar context. Sound good? I hope you're, you guys are getting a list of questions that you want to come to the microphone with. Have, has anybody heard of When Helping Hurts here? Hands? Anybody? Show me hands. Who has heard of? Okay. About a third of you. I would highly recommend this for any church group, any school group that talks about missions, any, any department that wants to involve their students in missions. And Helping Hurts is a great handbook that we've been using for close to 10 years now. I love its subtitle, How to Alleviate Poverty Without Hurting the Poor and Yourself. It really uncovers some of the issues that we faced after now nearly 40 years of the short-term missions movement that began circa 1970-ish. And the foundational concepts that it explores are the brokenness and reconciliation principles that's happening all over the world in all cultures with the truth of the gospel as it would permeate need and transforming good intentions into lasting change. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm losing the author's name right now, but Overrated is an interesting book that was just written by a pastor in Oregon. And I, I've just, Cho, maybe, Emmanuel Cho. He, he, he says in Overrated that we're probably more, somebody's nodding. Is that right? Did I get that author right in Overrated? Emmanuel Cho? Eugene. Eugene, thank you. It's Eugene Cho, thank you. Uh, I just heard him speak at our Accord Forum this year. Uh, Anyhow, overrated makes the supposition that we're probably more in love with the idea of serving the world and reaching the poor than actually serving the world and reaching the poor. <laughs> because there's a lot of sacrifice that comes into play when we start to get involved with how do we take good intentions and transform it into lasting change. So I'd recommend that book as, as a bit of reading. Overrated, that was. But when we look at our role as designers, problem solvers, creative thinkers in the world, here we have another Venn diagram, <laughs> but it's very much like the last one in terms of who we are. We're somewhere in the middle, bringing together the poor of the world, client ministries who are trying to reach those, and the volunteers, all of us, who would see ourselves as part of the army who could help meet need. And we come together in this place, and for EMI, we see us as a vehicle to allow that to happen. But we want to recognize that true partnership recognizes mutual need and participatory learning and action, where we have appreciative inquiry happening on, on deep levels with the people groups that we're serving and reaching so that we make them equals at the table to solve their problems instead of using that old adage in the, the title of the book, The West to the Rest, from years ago in missions. It's got to stop that model. It's time for that model to stop as we consider how do we raise up the church in all of the world, in all of its forms, wherever it is, and how do we partner as the silent partner? So the book, again, is full of practical strategies for short-term assistance without doing long-term harm. Now, EMI began, as I said, in the early 80s, and we were always a short-term missions model organization, serving the church and serving missionaries wherever they were with volunteer teams that we'd, we would bring for one or two weeks at a time. And this is me with a team nearly 18 years ago when we were still working with pencil and paper everywhere we went. And that's all EMI knew was that short, short-term missions model where we'd bring together the poor, the volunteers, and the client ministries. But today, we're growing way beyond that simple, classic EMI design team. EMI at the center now has discovered so many different places for the STEM disciplines to work themselves out in so many different ways, from appropriate technology expertise and appropriate technology product development. Those are the places where electrical and mechanical and chemistry majors can find a place to start inventing things, to start coming up with appropriate product improvement. And how does that impact the developing world? Disaster response, construction management, professional training, Water, sanitation, and hygiene, as it's known in contemporary slang, wash. All of these things are the outgrowths of where EMI began over 30 years ago, and we see opportunity just constantly growing for all of the disciplines of engineering, applied design of every kind to meet need in ways that perhaps you've never even imagined. And hopefully tonight you're beginning to imagine. Hopefully your, your eyes are being opened to possibilities that you were totally unaware of. 
And today we're beginning to use this little quick 3Ds kind of priority statements for EMI design, discipleship, and diversity. Historically, we've been largely Westerners, usually white and often men. So we're lacking a lot of diversity and we're seeing God bring diversity into EMI's world. We're still using design as a core definition of who we are and what we do, but looking to disciple the nations and find design professionals as young students come out of schools now in the developing world capital cities all over the globe. We're finding men and women who come out of engineering and architecture kind of STEM studies. They often can't find jobs because unemployment rates are so high, but they've received something of a foundational education. Maybe it's not quite equal to what you're receiving in the United States, but it's still an education in STEM related fields. And what could we do if we could find the believers among that population, bring them into the EMI fold, disciple them, and draw them in and create diversity by having nationals serving in all of our field offices, those offices that you saw all over the globe. And that's the direction that EMI is headed. So that we will have men and women of every tribe, tongue, and nation establishing EMI all over the globe. It will be a beautiful thing representing the body of Christ to the world. So we see construction management growing all over the globe. This happens to be a hospital complex in Nigeria. And we're but we're in, in East Africa, we're training and developing East Africans in construction and we're managing them. And we're sharing the gospel with them and we're discipling them and we're seeing our client ministries projects grow and be built. Uh, disaster response is a huge piece of what EMI is responding to in all the world. This happens to be me with a team of structural engineers in Haiti after the, the earthquake of 2010. And people are more ripe to hear the message of the gospel after disasters than any other time in their lives, especially when there's an influx of people ready to serve. But if those who are serving can also share the hope of the gospel with them, then we have that amazing both end of integral mission. Professional training, appropriate technology, local design professionals. This happens to be Hubrath, who is our first Indian architect in our India office. And that's the direction we're going. We have Indias in the India office, and we have uh, nationals in our Middle East, North Africa office, and we have Ugandans and Kenyans in our East Africa office. It's beginning to happen, and it's the most exciting future for EMI. So let's talk with the second half of what we have tonight of the practical steps. Our main objective and desire is to design with everything that we know we've received, all the tools of good design, everything that you're getting out of your education and your work experience. We take all of that and we adapt it to a new and unfamiliar and limiting environment. And what do we do with that? I already jokingly referred to the fact that I've never learned flexibility like I've learned now in the foreign field, in the developing world, because you just cannot transfer everything you know without a huge cross-cultural learning curve. And this is my quote that I've used for years. Nothing's the same once you've crossed an ocean. And that's not just the world of design, but the way you communicate, the words you use, the body language, the expressions, understanding people's communication styles, certainly language barriers. But that, then the food you eat, the way your body deals with that food or doesn't deal with that food, the time zone change, the jet lag that we experience as we travel, and on and on the list goes of all the cross-cultural challenges that we are learning and we train, with, we train our staff, we train our interns, we train our volunteers, we learn from years of experience and all the best teachers on the subject. How do we apply what we know cross-culturally? So we need to train ourselves to learn, observe, investigate the unique constraints of working in the developing world. And we need to then become aware of the direct impact of those constraints. So where do we begin? I would certainly just remind us that we begin in faith. We don't own any of this work. This work, when we step out into this, we have to let go of the reins. And how many of you are good at, lose, at giving up control? In a room like this, I would guess no one. We're all a bunch of perfectionist controlling planners in the, in the fields of study that we've chosen. We're good at it because we work so hard at controlling the variables and defining the problem and coming up with the right answer, the right solution. 
So the first thing we need to do is have a biblical, biblical perspective of serving the Lord and holding things loosely. And that doesn't come easy for this crowd. It doesn't come easy for me. I'd be the first one to confess that to you, and I know that you're thinking the same thing. And we pray, and we pray for those we serve. This is a great little statistic. We've recently done some study among all of our projects, just anecdotally, we haven't gotten into real deep research, but we recognize that nearly 75% of our projects have something built all around the world. That's a pretty good average when we're doing a work of faith. We have no control of how our designs actually get executed in the end. Sometimes because of our construction management program, we're involved right to the end. But that's limited compared to, we've done over 1,100 projects now all across the world. And, and the vast majority of those, we don't have control over how they're ultimately built, what actually happens with the designs that we've provided. But of them, we recognize that nearly 75% have had something built as a result of EMI's investment. So we're happy with that. We will ask God to continue doing that kind of work in us and we'll trust him for the greater work that he's doing for the kingdom. So where do we begin in designing a world of hope? So we begin in faith with hard work, but we really got to come back to this whole idea of what do we do as STEM folks? We, we're using scientific method here half the time. We're dealing with developing good program, ultimately to come to good design. And that means we have to ask the right questions, we have to test hypotheses, we have to constantly do a circular review of what we we're thinking and is the direction that we're going appropriate. So good program development, and yes, this is a little girl in a canoe in the Amazon with a monkey on her head. You're not in Kansas anymore when you step into the EMI world. And this was the first team I ever led for EMI as a young green engineer in my early 30s. I'm deep in the interior of the Amazon, an architect from Buffalo, New York. What in the world am I doing here was basically my question. <laughs> why am I here? <laughs> there was a big why. But we need to understand and interpret real needs so that we recognize real constraints and propose real solutions. That's a very oversimplified summary, but that's what we're doing. And it is something of the scientific method at work, constantly testing what we think we know and where we think we're going so that we come to the right conclusion. So we must learn to work within a different reality than we're used to. It's always going to be different. It's their reality, not yours. So good program, more about that it means what are our inputs? What is all the research that we're doing? Where do we get the vast majority of accumulating information? It can't just be what we already know from the West and transport it as if we just drop it down and impose it and overlay it on culture. That's rarely going to work. We need to let it grow from within as we find and obtain accurate and reliable information. From, from, good in, from good inputs, we come up with a solution. We ask ourselves, what's appropriate here? And again, you have to test what is appropriate. What we think is appropriate in a Western context is not necessarily appropriate in the developing world. And that's a moving target. So I'm not here tonight to give you one size fits all solution. I'm just asking questions. It's a moving target and we're constantly asking what's appropriate. So the output then is the priority and the right output is ensuring that design would be followed. So we have to understand that what we give back to a client ministry in the developing world context might look very different than a final solution or a design document that we have here in the States. So when we think about inputs, we need to keep things simple. And I don't know about you, but STEM does not lend itself well to simple. <laughs> There's some parts that might be simple when you boiled it down, but generally we're very good at overcomplicating things. We're very good at multiple layers of many different parts of the problem solving solution. So we need to come back to some basics and figure out how to keep things simple as we communicate, as we talk to people, as we get into the world of our clients, as we learn what the poor live with and how they live, we want to work within their reality, ask questions in a simple and accurate way, not leading the witness, so to speak. Open-ended questions, get them talking. Don't ask questions that are answered with a simple yes and no. 
And sometimes we have to ask multiple questions of multiple people in multiple ways because we get different answers constantly. We have examples of that from different projects, but I won't go into that. Our assumptions must yield. Again, we've got to learn to work within their reality. Um, some of you might recognize the inverse relationship of labor and materials, and that's kind of a critical thing when we think about applied design in the developing world context. In the West, the vast majority of budgets for everything we do goes to labor. And in the developing world, it's just the opposite. Labor is undervalued because people are undervalued. And labor does not carry with it nearly the budget quantities that it does in the West. And so that impacts how we design and how we actually work with those in the developing world. Remember that you are indeed far, far away. And so if we're working with a short-term model, it helps when our field offices are managing their own projects because they're there in the context of the people that they work and live with. But for those of us who live in a short-term model and constantly coming and going, we've got to try to collect every last possible piece of information because it's so much more difficult later when we get home. It's almost impossible to get information that you didn't get while you were there. So then the solution, keys to appropriate design. We have mutual discovery. I've already touched on this. Appreciative inquiry has not happened nearly enough in short-term missions and worldwide missions for generations where we make our clients an equal partner at the table, that they would get out from underneath this burden of being the poor and somehow not equal to the educated, wealthy Westerner who's coming with all the answers like the white knight on the steed. We've got to abandon that savior complex that the West has lived under because it's condemning to the rest of the world. We want our partners to recognize that it's a mutual discovery process because they understand their needs and we have to draw it out of them. And that's a huge job for the design professional, for the problem solver, for the creative thinker, is to help others draw out the solution. That it's not just my job alone, but our clients have something to add to the discussion. And together we discover what's best. And are we willing to say, I have something to learn? I, a Westerner, have something to learn? Yes. All of us have so much to learn from our developing world partners. And when Helping Hurts helps us see our own need in this equation, when we think about our own spiritual brokenness as Westerners that still might be every bit as significant as physical poverty and brokenness that's more demonstrable in the developing world. So more keys to the appropriate design. We use this metaphor of a ladder at EMI, that we recognize that if we live here at the top of the ladder in the West, in technology and development and engineering and architecture principles and design, the rest of the world might not even be on the ladder yet. And we can't raise them to the top of the ladder in one project. We need to help them take modest baby steps that can move them a little better, a little more functional, a little safer? What can we improve in small increments? How can we phase projects so that they're doable? A ministry that wants to house 500 orphans can't just build an orphanage for $2 million that's going to one day house 500 orphans. We need to help them take those steps slowly and practically with a phased design approach that helps them see that. We look at staying as long as we possibly can when we're in country, even though we're working with volunteers who are so often leaving their jobs. Again, our staying power is much stronger through the presence of our field offices and through nationals who would work in those field offices who are a part of this team, a part of the dialogue. But we recognize that one day in country is like a month back home. And we were, uh, Ensign just asked me at dinner tonight that how do we get a design accomplished in two weeks on the ground with a short-term team. And we work day and night, but we keep those disciplines working together, an interdisciplinary design team of engineers and architects and every imaginable discipline coming to bear. And they break up into small groups, they divide and conquer, they come back together every day, morning and night. They're debriefing, they're learning what needs to happen the next day, they're testing the hypothesis, they're going in a new direction if they need to, they're constantly reevaluating, and we have a design at the end of two weeks. It's quite remarkable. It takes two more months after that at least to refine everything, 
But while they're on the ground, they have a final design that they present to the ministry. And the ministry has helped establish that day after day after day as a partner at the table to test what we're doing. Are we hitting it? Are we getting it right? That sort of thing. When we, when we want to get to the right output and ensure the design is followed, it's fundamental that we've built strong relationships with our partners. And again, we as the highly educated Westerner cannot arrive as if we have all the answers. We have got to invest in relationship building in order to ensure that we could develop good design work all across the world. And so we build relationships almost like client and builder. And we don't always depend on detailed drawings. There's a, there's a lot that's simpler as we learn cultural differences and how anything gets built. Drawings will usually be a confirmation of an earlier held conversation so that when a developing world client sees a drawing, they will have a frame of reference of all the talking that went into the creation of that drawing. And we often keep drawings quite simple. They don't need to be very detailed. If we're only moving them a few rungs up the ladder, then we're working within the context of the constraints that they have that they're facing. And it's amazing that very often our buildings look like the drawings. They know how to build. They just need to be encouraged to build safer, better, with good design. And whether we're talking about buildings or whether we're talking about structure, or infrastructure like water, wastewater, when we think about the disasters of the world, then we're dealing with water and waterborne illness. And I've often thought if we could have EMI engineers and architects, designers of all kinds on the ground in most countries of the world, we could stem the tide of the need of Doctors Without Borders, we'd probably need half the medical missionaries that we have in the world today if we had engineering missionaries first. Because we solve so many of those problems that are related to bad water or bad sanitation or bad infrastructure. And so much of that is what plagues the developing world. Okay, let's just keep moving. Uh, we want to know the appropriate level of detail and design in what we give back. And sometimes they just need simple, schematic kinds of things, and look what they can build. And they don't, they don't have to be told every last thing detailed in a drawing that's hard for them to understand. They, the, graphically, we need to learn how to communicate in new ways, using new models and new tools, and certainly software that allows us to do all kinds of rendering uh, takes us there. A few case studies would be fun for us to end the night with. As we think about this one, learning flexibi flexibility in the field. The team was told that they'd be working on a small site with a few structures on it that, of course, the ministry contact was going to be with them every day, all the, all all the time, and they'd be staying near the site, and so all of their design investigation would be facilitated by these things. What actually happens? The site's much larger. There's so many existing structures on it. It makes a problem for developing good master planning. The ministry was never around, and they were staying a whole hour away from the site, making it hard to get back and forth and be on the site. How does that happen? We thought we had control of the, the variables, and we get there and everything's different. So then we just have to work within their reality, and we go with it. We go there and do what we did here. We take what we know, and we go. And then when we find what we, what's unexpected, we have to be ready to sort of fly by the seat of our pants and accept the challenges. In this particular case, the additional challenge was there was no electricity or water anywhere to be found to help in aid the design investigation. How about, um, here's a design goal from designing a primary school in a remote village. Think about the, the reality of this. Where we're going is this wide open bushland. There's no electricity, it's a three hour drive from the nearest town. There's very bad roads in the rainy season to access it. And there's a super high cost and demand for materials because of all those difficulties. High temperatures during the dry season. Now we're trying to design a primary school. Just the design work is gonna be challenging. But how about construction and what's the ultimate design going to come out of this? When you think about primary schools that you've ever been in, what kind of, how is the school laid out? Now, I know that you're not architects in this room, but just humor the architect that's giving this presentation. What does every school that you've ever been in look like, usually, in terms of a single building floor plan? Nobody wants to venture a guess, I know. But they're double-loaded corridors, right? One long corridor down a rectangular building with classrooms on either side. 
And that works in a Western context because we have utilities that cool the building and light the building. But that rarely works in the developing world context. Why? Because in the developing world, we don't have reliable electricity for lighting, and we don't have reliable HVAC systems, and we don't have the tools at our disposal half the time to make those models work that we've just assumed are the best solutions. In the developing world, we have to think passively for cooling and for lighting. And so certainly, in passive environmental design is constantly a part of the solution, just like in this primary school. So we look for orientation that will minimize direct sunlight and yet bring light into both sides of a classroom and orienting them so that we capture breezes, allow hot air to ventilate. And in the, whoop, in the end, usually classroom buildings are single loaded corridors in the EMI world. In the developing world, you have something that looks more like a motel rather than a school building with a double loaded corridor or, or a hotel. Because then you have a porch that can be covered with access points, doors and windows on one side, windows on the back side. You get natural lighting, you get natural ventilation. Very simple, and yet the, it's all about responding to context. It's all about understanding how do I adapt good design and work within their reality and understand that it's different than my reality. And then we'll use tools such as SketchUp or Revit or or rendering software that allows us to communicate graphically in ways that speak volumes to our developing world clients. And with the, the, last time, the, the last bit of time that I have with you, I'll just run you very quickly through this case study deep in the Amazon. As I said, this was the first team that I ever led, and we were serving YWAM. And how many of you are familiar with YWAM? Youth, youth with a mission, youth without any money. Uh, many, many different jokes about that acronym. But that I love YWAM. Uh, the, their, their work is almost always focused around training, outreach, and community development. They would usually do those three things on, on every YWAM base all around the world. And so we had the privilege of serving deep in the interior of the Amazon. If you picture South America and Brazil, of course, occupies the greatest majority of the center of South America, and the Amazon cuts right through the middle, all the way from west to east. And right in the heart of that is the city of Manaus, and about an, a, a day's riverboat ride away from Manaus is Mawez, this small village. And so we arrive in Manaus. Now I'm going to tell a little story, jot down some notes as I tell the story, because it impacts ultimately final design. And even though you might not be engineers and architects entirely in the room, some of you might be, um, you, can, you can follow along with this narrative and be creative with me by the end, all right? And for the sake of those who might be listening or watching this message later, the engineers and architects, they'll have some fun with this case study. So access is very difficult. We have to fly into this city of millions in Manaus. But how do we get to this small remote village? The next step, the missionary partner on the right, the American who married a Brazilian girl and has given his life over to reaching Brazil, takes us to buy hammocks. And we're wondering, hammocks? We have to buy hammocks. Why do we have to buy hammocks? So the next step is to go find a riverboat that will take us deep into the interior to this small village of Maues. Life happens on the water in the Amazon. So everything happens transported by water. So think about that when it comes to a design solution to meet people's needs with regard to building infrastructure. So everything we needed, we had to buy. We bought hammocks, we bought rice and beans, we bought tools, we bought equipment. I think we were carrying a few bags of cement. We had, of course, all of our luggage, and the team had to go find a boat. And the cacophony of confusion in a place like that was the very first time I experienced that sort of normal life on the Amazon for folks who live in Manaus. And then we had to head to our project site for 24 hours, and I would learned why we had to have hammocks, because this was our accommodation for 24 hours. <laughs> and I joke again that uh, it's not exactly what you're familiar with, is it? It's completely outside of our reality. And then we think we've arrived in Moez, and yet we still haven't, because we have one more boat to catch, this small little blue-topped boat. And that's my team all standing around on the dock, figuring out what the next step is. And then we have this sort of tributary to travel up into, all over the Amazon, to get to remote villages. And we find we're finally at our site, and we learn that 
the reality of what we're working in will speak to our design process. And we're, we're greeted by different visitors than at home. Somebody told me that if you're really serious about recruiting folks for EMI, then you don't take, you take these slides out of the presentation. That spider will blind you for a day if it bites you. We found one of those in our shower hut one day. That's their reality. Just think, it's a reality that we have no clue about. So when we arrive, I hear a chainsaw in the, in the distance, long way away. I learned that for about a few dollars a day, our missionary could hire a man who's so skilled with a chainsaw that he can cut plank lumber out of tree trunks. So he's always working, cutting trees down and milling lumber with a chainsaw. And the missionary had erected his first building, this long, giant, single slab, single story building. And it had all kinds of problems already happening with it. And so the team does forensic design investigation the minute we get there and we're studying what's working, what's not working. The big concrete slab foundation was expensive. It's in direct contact with the ground. It's already eroding around the ground because so much drainage off the roof with snow. Did I say it's wet in the Amazon? Rains every day. Very, very humid. Everything's sticky. <laughs> the wood plank siding's already molding. Some of it is rotting. Termites are already in the wood columns. The clay tile roofs that he used were terribly expensive, though durable, and a good product for the moisture. Very expensive to transport and to obtain back in the city and then bring all the way there. Well, the engineers are looking at the soil structure that's left and in the bottom here where you see that little satellite dish, you see this little concrete corner. That's actually the lid of a seepage pit. That's nothing but a 20 foot deep hole in the ground and all the waste goes directly to it. Civil engineers are immediately dealing with that in their mind saying that's not great. It's not a good solution for wastewater. How do we improve? What do we do better? What kind of design solutions would come out of that? And again, I won't take the time to ask for your opinions on the idea, but you might have some thoughts right away. And so as the team's learning, and again, we, we find that we have an open wall that hasn't yet been closed in, you can see that that's something of a wood studded frame with windows, and eventually that would all be planked in. And yet, the team was anxious to go hang their hammocks out there and sleep there, several of the guys, because it was so breezy and so open that it was much cooler than the closed in planked walled rooms that were so damp and humid. I would crawl in under my mosquito net onto my mattress and it would be wet. <laughs> so you'd sleep in that humid environment at night. Pretty uncomfortable to live in that reality. But it's helping us see that, wow, we need to really figure out passive strategies here because the thing that would really work for them would be openness for cool breezes and natural ventilation. And yet it's so rainy and the, the wind-driven rains would drive deep into that open space. How do we deal with covering and protecting and dealing with all of those problems? So we start to see the, the paradoxes that reveal themselves in the design process, in the investigation process. Taking what we know and going and learning to work within their reality requires us to deal with these. Um, civil issues, water, wastewater, how you deal with the jungle, all of those things have deep residing questions for civil engineers who are trying to deal with water supply and wastewater. Um, they had dug a, dug a well, we could, we could actually see soil strata that was left from a borehole that they dug, and we could understand what was happening in the ground. Uh, we saw clay content that was so high and so fine that it could actually be used for pottery. It was quite remarkable. If he could only create a, a mold structure and a kiln, he could perhaps bake and mold his own clay products. Think about what that might have as an impact on your design process. So when we see these construction practices and, and materials and design practices, this is where we start to uncover paradoxes because wood's plentiful, but for all of its weaknesses, maybe we don't want to use wood. And yet, for all of concrete and masonry's strengths, because of its expense and difficult access, maybe we shouldn't be using concrete or masonry, which would lead you back to wood. And in the end, you feel like you're stuck with all these paradoxes. And that's part of the design process, wouldn't you say? When you're, whenever you're presented with a design problem, very often, 
The riddle in it all is to try to identify the weakness of going with my first impression and finding something that's underlaid, finding something that causes us to think outside the box. And I love riddles for that reason in the EMI world, because riddles never have an answer that is the first and most natural approach. That's why it's a riddle. It's a left brain, right brain challenge to get out of the way you would normally think and into something brand new and different. And that's exactly what we do when we deal with paradoxes in design. How do we deal with solutions when it seems like everything doesn't work or everything needs to be limited and yet there must be a solution? And EMI, of course, came up with a solution. So some of you might have some thoughts. Um, is anybody interested in raising their hand or speaking out uh, w with regard to some of our problems that we had? We have a few moments that we could do that. We'll say we could save us for some Q&A too. But in the end, we have to use the things that have weaknesses. We have to maximize the things that have strengths. And there still has to be a both end, but working within a different reality and how to do it. So the UMI design has a number of things that work with this. So he, what you'll notice here is a small building raised up off the ground with minimal amounts of concrete, with giant overhangs, open porches, breezeways, and in every way we're dealing with using materials to maximize strengths and minimize weaknesses. And, and the, the natural thing that came to the missionary to do what he did was not at all good design. We had to take him to a world of compromise on certain things and figure out how do we maximize strengths, minimize weaknesses, and use a both-and approach. And so you see what all of this might have meant for a solution of YWAM's program included housing for missionary students, it included administrative space, classrooms for instruction, and so the building types were these very simple modular type buildings on pier foundations that require so little concrete. It separates termites in the ground from your building. Wide overhangs allow you to protect wood structure. It also allows for big porches and openings to allow for ventilation, all those good things. And small buildings allow civil and site issues to work themselves out in the context of a jungle full of trees all around them. I didn't really get into that as part of the presentation. But the basic floor plans were as open as possible using good ventilation strategies and using all the materials that were available and even the proposal of clay being made into tile right there on his site for his building roofs because he had the quality clay material in the ground that he could probably use for that. In the end, we're talking about minimizing and maximizing in effective ways. So let me just conclude with just this, this simple summary. Good design and development. We understand a right understanding and response is really built around compassion and service. We understand mutual discovery and partnership is fundamental, real listening, real relationship, appropriate design and assistance. Too much helping creates dependency. We want to move away from that model as we serve the world. Uh, we want to learn together. There's some teaching, training, and supervision, but people love to learn and grow. And finding answers together will build a stronger church worldwide. It'll build communities, it'll build people. And we learn to live simply. We learn to live simply as how we live and design simply in what we do. Everything needs to be about more simplicity and humility and service. So with all that, I'd love to invite you, anybody who's uh, able to stay with us and ask a few questions to come on up and, and ask away. Uh, to repeat it, just basically, when helping hurts helps us n realize how do we help a ministry understand whether or not this project is appropriate, what they've requested, is this appropriate, and are we able to help decipher that with them. Most of the time, ministries are asking us for assistance with what they're trying to do already. So at the onset, they usually prove themselves by the fact that they're already engaged in ministry. And they're coming to the place where they need 
design assistance from technical professionals. So most of the time in the EMI world, we can see the validity right in the application process. And we have quite a detailed application process that requires them to really define their priorities, their ministry objectives, how they're building the kingdom of God, how they're meeting the needs of the poor, how they have a strategy to get their project built, how they will manage their project. We ask them to walk through all of that with us so that they really are testing what they're thinking through and it allows us to test it with them. But it's mostly them expressing their project to us and helping us understand it. And most of the time, EMI is readily able to agree with them that this is a viable and valid project for the sake of moving forward in your service to the poor and the kingdom. But occasionally, we're challenged. And I had a situation just like that happen recently. I was leading a team in Kenya, and a white Western couple had adopted this small village and taken on the responsibility of trying to raise up financial partners from the West to help this small village build an orphanage for orphans due to AIDS. And they have a dozen or so and growing population of orphans in this area. And currently the local church members are housing those orphans in their homes. And I struggled for two weeks with that team thinking, how is building an institutional style village center of orphan homes better than these orphans being cared for in the homes of these families of the church? And it's a valid question, wouldn't you say? And I, I really wrestled with that in my heart, that they wanted an orphan home campus with house parents in different homes so that it was very communal and family style. But I, I really wondered, how is this better? And are we really helping or are we hurting? And I struggled with that for the whole two weeks. And we continued with the project and we came up with a wonderful design. And over the course of the week, I could see just how maxed out these village families were by their care for the extended needs of orphans. And they had so little of their own already. To share it with orphans in their own homes was an enormous burden and an enormous strain. And I would not have known that just being a Westerner looking from the bird's eye view a thousand miles away, right? I could only know and see the strain in the family's lives by being there with them. So I learned a huge lesson. And then I could see that partnership with Westerners was probably a right solution for them. I still was wrestling with that even as we were bringing the team home. And we had stopped for the team to do some shopping at a local market where uh, a woman had created a business for single women to support themselves by making pottery and jewelry and leather goods. And this was a well-established business and our, our guide who was driving us all the way across the Rift Valley in Kenya knew of it. He took us there so that our team could buy a few souvenirs and things to bring home as our team so often want to do. And I'm standing out there. I had certainly done that, seen that. I didn't need to shop. I'm waiting for my team. I'm out alone on the little patio in front of this shop. And a young Kenyan woman starts to talk to me and ask us what we're all about. And I tell her that we were a team of volunteer engineers and architects who had come to design an orphan home uh, out in a remote village. And she said something very peculiar to me. I didn't expect it. She said, ah. it almost gets me choked up a little bit. She said, oh, the children must have loved you. And I thought, that's such a strange response. But it's true. The children do love us, and they treat us like we're some sort of hero. And I told her that. I said, oh, yes, absolutely. They do love us. They, they treat us like we're some kind of hero. And I'm trying to downplay it, taking a humble approach that we're not heroes. And I wasn't even sure in my heart that we were doing the right thing at that moment. And she just launches at me with such an expression of delight and surprise. She says, but you are heroes. She says, I grew up in an orphan home like that. My sister and my brother too. And we had nothing and we were rescued. And the people would come and love on us who served that orphan home. The people, she was referring to people just like us who were coming from the West. She said, we had nothing but they rescued us. And we loved them and they loved us. 
And her personal testimony so ignited me, I, I had to call the team together right outside the door and ask her to repeat that and tell her story to the team. Because sometimes we just don't know if what we're doing is helping or hurting. And I'm, I'm pretty convinced God sent her along just to help me with all that I was wrestling with. To say, mm, remember that slide where I talked about it all begins in a faith journey, all of us taking a step of faith together? And sometimes we don't know what we don't know. But we're believing, we're following what God has laid out for us to do and asking him the questions all along the way. And Lord willing, he's leading and guiding and directing our steps.